Good morning, Maple Avenue Baptist Church. You can be turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. If you're using the Bible in the pew, it's on page 8. Genesis 12, page 8 in the pew Bible. So I just wanted to make um, an introductory remark, or just a, a remark at the beginning of the sermon, just in the life of our church. Uh, we, we just want to inform you, as a church, we sent this out in e-news, and um, I, I think we've been uh, just giving you updates as it relates to you know, transitions in terms of staff and things like this. So we have uh, put together and put up a job posting for a youth minister position, and uh, so that's on our website. And so please, uh, the main reason I tell you is just so you're informed uh, as a church body, so you can be in prayer. Uh, obviously, the, the person who fills this role as the youth minister uh, in the life of our church is an important role uh, to, to the youth, to the families, as well as to the staff, uh, and to the whole church. And so please be in prayer uh, for that whole process. And obviously, if you're aware of someone looking for a youth minister position, then you can send, the, send them to our website, or you can send them my direction, and I'd be happy to, to talk with him. Uh, so that's just a little bit of an update in terms of uh, uh, church news. Uh, so again, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and if you would rise for the reading of God's Word. Hear what Holy Scripture says. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What do we say at this point? This is the Word of God. <laughs> wow, well, let's hope that that's not uh, an indication of things to come. You can be seated as we pray. <laughs> I woke up too early this morning or something. I don't know. Maybe the time change. That was last week, though. All right, let's pray together. Oy. Father, thank you for this morning. We are grateful and glad to be your children. We're so blessed by your grace and mercy. And uh, we are sinful, broken, weak, and lost and helpless on our own. And it is your grace that forms us into being the people that we are. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus that is our hope. It is Christ who is our Savior it is he that meets all of our needs, and we're so glad that as a people that Jesus is the center of all that we do, say, think, and are. And so I just pray that that would be on display this morning, that Jesus would be exalted, that his saving power would be made known and clear, that you would help me as the preacher to make your word plain and clear for all who are gathered here this morning. And that you, O oh God, would be with us in these moments as we look to your word together as a church body. We pray that you be at work in the hearts and lives of each one. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the beginning of Missions Week. And obviously our goal as we commence this week is to focus our thought on missions. That is the redemptive work of God to expand the kingdom of, of his son by the spreading of the gospel, the translation of the scriptures, and the planting of churches amongst all the people groups of the earth. That's what we want to focus our thought on this morning. Now, I feel like we're at the start of a new sports season, though. Perhaps you like to ski. Uh, I like to snowboard, but... It's, you know, it's relatively similar you're, you're, in terms of what you do and how you get ready. You're getting ready for the ski season. But you haven't gone skiing since last spring, so you have to kind of gather all of your equipment together. 
Uh, you have to make sure that it's all there, and you have to remember all that goes into a ski day. Your work is quadrupled if you have children. So you have to reorient yourself. It's not like you're learning a new sport, but you, have, you need a refresher. You need a bit of an arm wrap to get skiing again, and I, I feel that as we enter into missions week, I feel that we need a refresher. Collectively, we need to be reoriented to the task and priority of missions. Now, to be clear, there is no off-season for missions. It ought to be our mandate, our mission, 24-7, 52 days a week, or 52 weeks a year, sorry, and it's 365 days of the year till Jesus returns or calls us home. But knowing my own heart and this church, I think it would serve us well to be reminded by the scriptures of this concept of missions. So that's what I want to do this morning, is I want to reorient our thoughts. I want to focus our attention on the subject of missions as we embark on Missions Week. Now, most of what we'll be doing is next weekend on the uh, Saturday and the Sunday, but there'll be kind of missions emphasis, you know, throughout, uh, obviously, this morning and then even in uh, the ministries of our church. So I want to begin at the beginning. And if you're taking notes this morning, the first point is this. Adam's sin brought a curse into this world, okay? Adam's sin brought a curse into this world. Now, we live in a broken world, don't we? We live in a chaotic world. We live in a divided world. We live in a painful world. There are things like the atrocities of Hamas in Israel There are things like divorce, which result in the tearing apart of families. There are things like betrayal by a trusted friend. And in this world, there are things like Alzheimer's disease, where a husband might not even be able to recognize his wife of 50 years towards the end of his life. There are also pains that we carry because of things that we have done, and there are also pains that we carry because of things that have been done against us. Many people struggle with mild or intense forms of anxiety or depression, and then others struggle with being comfortable in their own bodies. They just hate their bodies. The list just goes on. And one of the things that I love about the Bible is that it explains these things to us. Not the exact reason for every hardship in our lives, but it explains why our world is the way that it is, why none of us can escape the brokenness of this world we call home. And that explanation is found beginning in Genesis chapter 3. You don't necessarily have to turn there. You can if you want to, but you can just jot down Genesis 3. And this is how the narrative goes. This is the Bible's explanation as to why our world is the way that it is in terms of the brokenness and the mess. This is how it goes. Adam and Eve, the first couple, the first man, the first woman are in the garden. They're minding their own business. And then Satan... The one who is intent on destroying humanity deceives Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit and leads Adam to rebel against his maker and king. Nothing will be the same after this day. Now, on September 27, 2019, Alyssa and I sat in a hospital room at McMaster Children's Hospital. We had been there for the past 18 hours or so as Noah was being tested, and right around supper time on the Friday, Dr. Athali, the on-duty oncologist, walked into our room and confirmed our worst fears, that our son, in fact, had leukemia. Our world changed unalterably on that day. And just as our day was forever changed on that September day in 2019 as parents, in a much deeper, more significant, and far-reaching way, the world was forever changed the day Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. By taking a bite of the fruit, Adam unleashed into the world all that is wrong with the world. The conditions of the world were forever altered on that day, and it it affects us down to this 
very day. Let me share with you some of the things that happened in the wake of the fall. And I hope that you're able at different points as I explain Genesis basically 3 through 11 in short form, in bullet form, that you will be able to identify with some of the brokenness that is mentioned in these chapters. Okay? First of all, as soon as Adam and Eve rebel against their maker, they feel compelled to the core of their being to hide from God and to hide from one another. They probably couldn't quite put their finger on what had happened, but something clearly had gone awry. But even before they were confronted, they were immediately felt that they were not okay, that something was wrong with them. They were guilty over what they felt guilt over what they had done, and they felt shame over who they were. They were no longer okay with who they were. And they were no longer okay with God knowing who they were. They were no longer okay with others knowing who they were. I wonder if you can identify. They start to shift the blame in their marriage. A chapter before, Adam is like, she is the one. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. God, you have outdone yourself. She is perfect. Then... God approaches Adam and says, so tell me about this fruit that you ate. To which he says, it was her. Do you remember that woman that you gave me? Yes, I ate, but she ate first and I just followed her lead. It was her. So there's blame shifting in marriage, but in other relationships as well. And then as we march on through Genesis 4 through 11, let me just highlight a few other things. There's Cain and Abel. Cain is jealous of his brother Abel. And so seeks to murder him. So now we live in a world where there is such a thing as homicide. And then in Genesis chapter 5, do you want to know how every section or paragraph ends? It ends with these ominous words. And he died. The warning, the curse of Genesis 3, the man shall return to the dust from which he came, was playing out and coming true. Now we live in a world where death is the inevitable norm. Genesis 6, 5 says this, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So then God brings a worldwide, global, catastrophic flood to destroy the earth and its inhabitants And then after the flood, there are eight people who disembark off the ark. And there is some hope that Noah, the leader of this clan, would be the deliverer. He would be the curse reverser. He's sort of a new Adam in this sense, but he gets drunk. He uncovers himself, brings shame upon himself, and therefore he is disqualified from being the deliverer. And then fast forward to the Tower of Babel. The people of this earth have this great idea to put together their technological ingenuity and come together to erect a great monument to their own accomplishments while completely disregarding the God who gave them breath and life and everything. So God comes to confuse the language of the people. This is at Babel. So the question is, what happens when there are thousands of people, we don't know the exact number obviously, but thousands, perhaps tens and hundreds of thousands of people in this one city, and then the language of the people are confused, and, and, and all the people speak different languages, what would happen? You would start to discover that there are people within this multitude that speak the same language as you. So then naturally you would gather into these smaller groups. We might call them nations or people groups. They are united by nothing but language at first. But then these smaller groups would develop their own cultures and customs. They would settle in different regions. They would become distinct people groups. And now, okay, now that the world is sufficiently messed up, and God has allowed the world in his sovereignty to experience the effects of the curse and the fall in some significant ways, And he has also caused the formation of nations, which is important for the plan of redemption to go according to plan. Now God is ready to act. I don't want you to miss this. God has allowed the fall. He has cursed the world. He has brought a flood upon the world as an act of judgment. 
And he has, as another act of judgment, confused the languages of the people of the earth so that they are divided into nations. And now, finally, God is ready to enact his plan of redemption. So what will God do? The world is in sin and error pining, as the Christmas song says. What will God do? Well, he shines his light into the darkness in the most unexpected of ways. He calls to himself a pagan from a pagan family, and he makes to Abram a promise. So this is the second point if you're taking notes. God intends to bless the world through Abraham. God intends to bless the world through Abraham. And in the flow of Genesis 1 through 12, in Genesis 3 through 11, there's a lot of brokenness, and there's a lot of mess, and there's a lot of curses, and there's a lot of death. So all of a sudden, for us to hear the word blessing, it should cause our ears to perk up. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Abram, Ab- Abram is promised a land, a people, and a blessing. A land, a people, and a blessing. And I want to focus our attention on the blessing part of that promise. In Genesis 12, 3, the Lord says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So just to fill this out slightly then, if you're aligned with Abraham, you will be blessed. If you're opposed to Abraham, then you will be cursed. So the story narrows in on Abraham. And so all the world should be paying attention to Abraham because it it was through Abraham that the world would be blessed. Later, this promise is repeated to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and it becomes clear that it would be through Abraham's offspring that the world would be blessed. Now, I understand this is a lot of details, a lot of things to hold in your head, but here here is my very simple summary, okay? You are an inhabitant of the earth. You are a citizen of the world. You are part of the brokenness and the mess of this world. You, like most normal people, desire to be blessed. And particularly, you desire to be blessed by the divine. And what the Bible is saying is that the way that you, as an inhabitant of this earth, can be blessed is through the seed or the offspring of Abraham. You should be paying attention. If you you say, I want to be blessed by God, I want blessing in my life, then you should be paying attention because God is telling you and I am explaining to you how it is that you can be blessed by Almighty God. And just to be very clear then, when we say that the world would be blessed, okay, that's what we've been talking about, we're not just saying that a bunch of individual people would be blessed by God. Rather, more specifically, what we're saying is that the clans, tribes, and nations of the earth would be blessed through the seed of Abraham, okay? So to put it into sort of like Jewish terms, we might say, well, God didn't just intend to bless the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. He actually intended to bless all the nations of the earth. And as Christians, that sounds like an obvious statement, but this truth was very much lost on the Jewish people by the time the Lord Jesus came into this world. So you remember the story of the Samaritan woman, okay? And in that story, what was happening is that Jesus was bringing to this Samaritan woman a word of salvation. And he wanted her to know that the place where you worship is not as important as the heart of the worshiper. And the story is told in such a way that it was nearly scandalous that Jesus was speaking to this first person. First, because he being a man was speaking to a woman. But second, he being a Jew was speaking to a Samaritan. You see, in the eyes of the Jews, salvation was of the Jews and for the Jews and probably full stop, period. But God, from the very beginning, has said and declared to us that his heart is not just for the Jewish people, but it is for all the nations of the earth. In fact, the Old Testament is replete with God's heart towards the nations. And maybe I can just give you just a few of these to give you a sense of this in the Old Testament. Psalm 96, which is often called the missionary psalm, it says this, 
Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Psalm 67, it says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations, that the peoples praise you, O God, that all the peoples praise you, that the nations be glad and sing for joy. Do you want to know why that's important for you? Okay, um, let me put it this way. None of us wake up in the morning and say, I I wonder how I can make myself miserable today. I wonder what I can do to seek my own misery. Now, some people, you watch their life from afar, and it's like, I I wonder if that's the case with you, but (laughs) most of us. We do not naturally, innately seek our own misery and sadness. In fact, it is innate to the human soul to seek our own happiness. And the God of the Scriptures very clearly in Psalm 67 is declaring here to us that he wants the peoples of the earth, he wants the nations of the earth, he wants the tribes and the clans of the earth to be happy people. But he wants them to be happy in him. So if we put these things together then, God wants to bless the nations. And he wants to bless the nations through Abraham's offspring. How does this work? How does this happen? You know, because we could think, okay, well, maybe it's like I have to become a Jewish person. So, you know, if you trace Abraham's line, it goes Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and then to the 12 tribes. And so so maybe it's like I have to become essentially, like obviously I can't become a Jew by ethnicity, but I have to become a Jew by, by practice and by culture and by religion. Maybe that's how I become blessed. Well, that's not the case. And for this, let's just turn here to Galatians chapter 3. And I want to show you how this works, okay? God wants to bless the nations. He wants to bless the nations through Abraham's offspring. It's not by becoming an ethnic or even religious Jew. So how is it that you can be blessed as one who is amongst the nations? Genesis, or sorry, what did I say? Galatians. Galatians 3. It's on page 973 in the Pew Bible. Galatians 3, verse 8 and 9. It says this. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Jump with me down to verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Galatians 3, verse 28 now. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So this is a really important question. I think especially if you're not a Jewish person, especially if you're outside of Israel, then that would be a natural question for you to be asking. Okay, I understand that it's through Abraham's offspring or Abraham's line that the world will be blessed, but how can I be blessed? Very simply, it is through Christ. Second, it is through Christ's sin-bearing death upon the cross. And third, it is through wholehearted trust in Christ and his death on our behalf that we can access God's intended blessing for the world. You're here, you're a human being, you're breathing, you have an innate desire in your soul to be blessed and to be happy. The way that God says that you can be blessed and be happy is by accessing divine blessing through Abraham's offspring. This is how you do it. You look to Christ. You look to his death on the cross for, for you on your behalf and you trust in him wholeheartedly by faith. Now, if all that I said is true, that the world is messed up beyond belief, that our own lives are a part of that mess and beyond our fixing power, and therefore we long for divine assistance and blessing in our brokenness and mess, then there are two massive implications 
of that theology. It's not just ideas in our mind. It's not just um, truths that we sort of sign off on paper, but then never allow to affect our lives. No, there are two massive implications of that theology, and I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about those this morning. So if you're taking notes, third, Jesus is the only hope for the nations. Jesus is the only hope for the nations. Now, I hope that you've been hearing that theme over and over here this morning, but the God of the Scriptures has a heart for the nations. God cursed the world and pronounced judgment upon the world for its rebellion. So the world fully deserves to be in a state of division and disarray because it has rejected God and His ways. But the key takeaway for us is this. That God has not abandoned the world. He has not given up on the world. And that is our hope, that the God of the universe is seeking to make followers of His Son amongst the rebellious people groups of the earth. Now, this is also key as we talk about missions. And Martin Lamb's going to come and talk to us about some of these matters, but let me just sort of give a preview to that. Many of us think that the mission of God in the world is to save as many individuals as possible. But that's actually imprecise. Many of us think that God's mission is to save as many people in the world as possible, but that's not quite accurate. God's mission is to save people from all the people groups of the world. So yes, certainly God wants to save many, many people, but he also wants to save many people from all the people groups of the world. William Carey is known as the father of modern missions. And when he looked throughout church history to find a comparison for the work that they were doing in Saranpur, he actually looked back to the 5th century figure, St. Patrick. Now, you probably know a few things about St. Patrick. It's probably all wrong. <laughs> for instance, Pat Patrick was not Irish. He was born in Roman Britain. And he was actually taken into captivity by Irish raiders while he was a teenager. And while he was in Ireland working as a slave, he was converted to Christianity. He escapes back to Britain, but then he has a vision which convinces him that he must be a missionary to the Irish people, a people who, according to Patrick, always worshipped idols and filthy things. Now, Patrick was convinced to go to the Irish peoples by passages like the Great Commission, and also, in his mind, he had the privilege of preaching the gospel to the last nation to be evangelized. Because if you think about it, Ireland is on the outermost edge of the world at this juncture. Now, Patrick's geography was obviously mistaken, but his theology was spot on. He wrote this, In the last days I dared to undertake such a holy and wonderful work, thus imitating somehow those who as the Lord once foretold, would preach his gospel for a testimony to all nations before the end of the world. So we have seen it, and so it has been fulfilled. Indeed, we are witnesses that the gospel has been preached unto those parts beyond which there lives nobody. So the Great Commission calls us not just to reach as many individuals as possible, but to reach individuals from all the people groups of the earth. So, you know, Martin Lamb is going to come and he's going to talk about these things more at length. Reached, unreached, uh, people groups and define those things. Uh, and, we, and we'll learn from him and I think that that will be helpful. But I, I want us to feel something as a church this morning. I want you to feel it personally. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I want you to feel it for the nations. That the only source of everlasting blessing is found in Jesus Christ. The only hope for the world, the only hope for the nations, the only hope for the tribes and clans of the earth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without hearing the gospel clearly articulated, without conscious belief in the biblical Jesus, the people of the earth are hopelessly lost and headed for eternal damnation for their rebellion against God. Do 
believe this. We, we, we could talk about missions funds and mission strategies and mission strengths, but I just want you to feel the burden of this. That the peoples of the earth, including our neighbors, relatives, co-workers, and friends, are utterly hopeless and lost without the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it is not my habit to give a list of like, you know, here's some things that you can do as a result of this sermon. Here's some thoughts that I have. I, I don't typically do that. But I thought for today it might be helpful to provide a few, and I'm using this word deliberately, suggestions. So don't feel guilty if you don't do these things. But just suggestions on how you might engage in the work of missions personally. And at MABC, these are not rocket science. I've just kind of jotted down a few thoughts. First, pray about these things. Talk to God and ask him how he might use you in his great commission. Pick a missionary that you know or one that our church supports and pray for him or her. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, my heart is cold towards the lost, both locally and globally. Well, then that's something to pray to God about. That God would give to us his own heart for the nations and for the lost. Second, read a missionary biography. There's one by Piper in the library, Filling Up the Afflictions of Christ. Uh, Vance Christie, I don't know if these are in the library, but has written on Adoniram Judson and Hudson Taylor in a slightly different vein, but I think he was a missionary pastor. Uh, Tom Carson's biography, Memoirs of an Ordinary Pastor, this is in the library. He was a missionary pastor to uh, the province of Quebec from the 1930s to the 1980s. That's a great biography. Uh, Third, I just jotted this down. Talk to your neighbor. Ask them about their culture, their homeland, and their religion, and People of other cultures, I'm sure you've experienced this, are actually much more willing to talk about these things than we in the West are. They say that Toronto is the most multicultural city in the world, and that's a unique opportunity for us who live in Georgetown. Fourth, and I've already mentioned this, but I I just think it would be helpful for you to come to Missions Conference. If you have plans that day, don't feel guilty about not coming, but if you're available and desirous, then I just invite you to come. I think it would be really helpful for you as we talk about reached versus unreached people groups what does that even mean what is, is a people group the same as a as, as a nation and and how should we understand that modern missiology really is the category that we're talking about i also think that it would be helpful for you encouraging to you to hear about the work of ethnos canada as we hear from martin and then fifth ask yourself these questions would i be willing to go if god were to call me to the mission field And second, am I willing to be actively engaged in this church's efforts to reach the nations if I'm called to stay? That's the first implications. So God wants to bless the nations through Abraham. The first implication is that Jesus is the only hope for the nations. The second is this. Jesus is the only hope for you. This is Missions Week. And this is intended to be a missions sermon. But first and foremost, I am a pastor of this congregation. And I have the responsibility to bring the gospel to you who are sitting in this room. And I want you to hear this. Because I know we all, um, you know, look nice and have dressed nice. But I know that in a room of this size, that there are people walking into this room um, desperate and hopeless. Lost and confused broken and battered and hurt and in pain. And I just want you to know some things this morning. This applies to you if you've been a follower of the Lord Jesus for 20 years. This applies to you if you have not yet committed your life to Christ, but you're interested in these things, and so you are here. I want you to hear that there is great hope for you. And that God desires to bless you. That he longs to forgive you and to heal you who are sinful and broken. God is in the business of healing hearts and forgiving sinners. So much so that he created the world and the universe to put his power and desire to save on display. That's why he created the universe. It's to save sinners like you and me to put on display his matchless glory. He loves to save sinners. I want you to know that there is hope for you. And and, and there's blessing and healing held out for you. But there's only one place to find that healing and blessing, that hope and that forgiveness. 
In all the world, there is only one place to find divine blessing in the ways that we're talking about here this morning. It's not found in life hacks and life coaches. It's not found in you embarking on a journey to discover who you truly are. It's not found in finding love in a partner. It's not found in establishing a family. It's not found in reaching your career milestones. It's not found in ordering your life to be just the way you want it. It's not found in the false spiritualities of our day like yoga and Eastern meditation. No, the only place to find this blessing and holistic salvation is in the baby of Christmas. It is in the Christ of the scriptures. It is in the lamb who was slain on the cross for the sins of the world. It is in the Savior who was raised on the third day. It is in Jesus who is the Savior of the world. Let me just say this to you. Sometimes we make this into an intellectual game. You say, well, yeah, I I agree, you know, my life's pretty messed up, I I see sin in my life, Um, but what about, like, science versus religion? Or you say, well, like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, some of the things that you're, you're, make, you're saying, it, it resonates with me. Um, but what about, like, the, the manuscripts and all the translations that are out there? What about denominations? Doesn't that, like, under, undermine and undercut Christianity? And, and that's fine. We can have those conversations. I'd be glad to talk to you. But is your life messed up? Is your life broken? Do you look in a mirror and see a righteous person, or do you see a broken sinner? And I know that when I look in the mirror, all that I see is a broken, battered, and bruised sinner who is deserving, not of God's favor, but of God's wrath. And I'm so glad that God had compassion on me to show his grace to me so that my life can be changed forever and a day. So let me just say this to you. If you're sitting here broken and shattered because of the decisions that you have made, because of the decisions that others have made, because of things that were outside the control of any human decisions, and you identify with the mess of Genesis 3 through 11, you're not okay with who you are. You feel the guilt and the shame. You feel the need to cover yourself and hide. You you know that you shift the blame on others. You feel envy and jealousy in your heart every time you open up Instagram or look at somebody else's life. Maybe you're not a murderer, but you have hatred and bitterness in your heart. And then there are some of us who are tempted daily to make a great name for ourselves, to trust in our own abilities, all while forgetting about the God who made us and has given us everything. If you're feeling that this morning, let, let me just say to you, you can't afford to not embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't keep living on your own, for your own self, according to your own ways, because that has led you further and further down into the muck and mire of the mess. So if you're sitting here this morning and you sense that the Spirit is working in your life to convince you of these things, then do not delay. Come to Christ. It is not rocket science and it is not complicated. The the Scriptures are clear that you must repent That you must turn away from doing things your own way and allow Christ to be Lord over your life. This doesn't mean that you will now be perfect or even that you won't sin in some big ways. But it does mean that at the bottom of your heart, you want Jesus to be the most important thing and not anything else. And you must also believe. You must believe yourself to be a sinner and that Jesus is your only hope for forgiveness and salvation, that you're not trusting in Jesus and some other deity, that you're not trusting in Jesus and yourself but that you're trusting in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins. And what you desperately need, broken person, battered and bruised person, what you desperately need, friend, is for Jesus to come and take you by the hand and lead you to greener pastures. In this case, the grass is greener on the other side. And I just want to be very clear in warning you. If you're going to reject that message, then you, not God, not the church, not other Christians for you, but you are rejecting the channel of God's blessing for your 
life. God desires to bless the world. He desires to bless the world through Abraham. He desires to bless the world through Abraham's ultimate offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus took upon himself your sins and your brokenness upon the cross so that you can be freed and forgiven. And that message of salvation and forgiveness and freedom and healing and restoration and blessing is held out for you. And all you must do is repent of ruling your own life and turn to Christ. And you must repent of trusting in yourself and trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins and for the cleansing of your soul and for the hope of eternal life. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. I just pray that the, some of the things that we've talked about this morning would be helpful, it would be convicting, it would be clarifying, it would be challenging, it would be saving, it would be sanctifying in the life of every individual person here. Be gracious to us, O oh God, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.